A Less Than Royal Narcissist, Part 40.1 Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. First of all, it is my solemn duty to report on a schism which has arisen between the chickens of authenticity currently housed at Tudor Towers. As you are aware, I appropriated three frozen chickens from the parson's nose to ensure my authentic credentials were authenticized. The three chickens were labelled David Peckham, Egg Sheeran, and Cluck Norris. Last night, as I observed the frozen chickens of authenticity from my obsidian throne, and as I looked into the Stygian gloom, I noticed that I had actually placed David Peckham far too close to Cluck Norris, and the furnace-like heat that radiated from the toughness of Cluck Norris defrosted David Peckham. It was therefore necessary for me to commit David Peckham to the oven of purifying salvation and eat him. Those not imbued with the stoic fortitude might well be concerned that the authenticity of your glorious narrator might be diminished. Cast your fears aside, good listeners, for a call has been placed to Rodrigo for a replacement so that the unimpeachable triangle of chicken authenticity is soon restored. However, in the meantime, this requires a show of solidarity, and I am calling on you, the legion of listeners, the vanguard of viewers, the advocates of authenticity, to demonstrate your solidarity for the most noble cause of authenticity by going to the link, Are You Authentic?, which you will find in the video description and availing yourself of adorning the avatar of authenticity. It is at times such as these that a new way of being must be embraced, an organic origin for that most precious of commodities, authenticity. Be bold, be proud, be you, the authentic you and acquire your chicken of authenticity, sealed gold, no less, and let the world know through your avatar that no longer will you stand for this rampant inauthenticity, but you are more authentic than the genuine authentic authenticness. My thanks in advance. That's the first order of business to address the pressing matter of the chickens of responsibility, a matter I know that you hold dear to your hearts. Secondly, many of you have come here drawn by watching the car crash or the train wreck that appertains to the world of Meghan Markle. This has also enabled you to understand what's happening with regard to her behaviours and her interactions through the lens of narcissism. But I would also invite the many of you who listen here to avail yourself of the additional material that you will find in this vast vault of knowledge. You may well have found that the circumstances that you've witnessed have a parallel to things that you have experienced in your own life, whether romantically, within your family, socially, or perhaps your job, maybe with a neighbour, a colleague, a friend. There is a wealth of free information amongst all of my many, many videos. If there is a subject, just search HG Tudor and the subject next to it, and in likelihood, the video will appear. Where I can, I will direct you to it. But those of that you have come here to my channel, drawn by wanting to know more about Meghan Markle, I would also invite you, whilst you are here, to take advantage of the wealth of information and embrace the other material also. With that said, 
what has now been going on in the world of royal narcissists. I have as late taken to seeing what the latest news, as reported by various online and print outlets, have to say appertaining to the royal family and Meghan Markle. What new pronouncements have come from Montecito? What reactions have been prompted, say, from Piers Morgan, or those commenting upon Piers Morgan? And I do so, accessing, of course, a variety of news outlets. I do not speak for the veracity of these outlets. I leave that to you. You, for the most part, anyway. I see one or two exceptions in the comments. But for the most part, you are intelligent, constructive listeners. And you are perfectly capable of making your own minds up as to the veracity of the information that is being printed, either online or in the physical world. You can work it out whether you believe it or not. What I merely do is provide the interpretation of that information as to what is really going on when viewed against the narcissistic dynamic. I pass no judgment with regard to the qualities of the Sun newspaper or the Daily Mail or such like. Many people access that information and it forms a daily diet. I take my news across a variety of sources. But naturally, the nature of the ongoing situation is covered by many news outlets, often quoting another first. For instance, the Daily Mail often gets in there first and finds itself reported in The Independent, The Times, The Daily Telegraph and such like. Now, what has been reported on? What further shenanigans do we have appertaining to royal narcissists? Well, actually today there's going to be involvement with two. First of all, the Daily Mail, and as widely reported across other news outlets, talks about the issue of what will be worn at the Duke of Edinburgh's funeral. The Daily Mail reports, the Queen is being forced to decide which rank of military uniform the Duke of York, Prince Andrew, can wear to his father's funeral after he demanded to go as an admiral. Those of you who haven't accessed a very royal narcissist part five will find Prince Andrew going under the Tudor scope. And therefore, if you haven't listened to that and you want to, I suggest you stop listening now because I'm about to give information away. Those of you who have already accessed it or have already know the product of the outcome, Prince Andrew Andrew, of course, is a narcissist. And it is interesting to see it reported that the Duke of York has demanded to go as an admiral. One can almost picture him running in in shorts, chubby-cheeked, rosy cheeks afire. Mama, mama, but I want to go as an admiral. Why can't I go as an admiral? And, of course, Prince Andrew, being a rather bluff and in-your-face narcissist, somewhat aggressive, grandiose, and unapologetic in his behaviours, supremely arrogant and entitled, fails, of course, to see that demanding to go as an admiral after his recent behaviours, a la Jeffrey Epstein, does not portray him in a particularly good light. But... He isn't concerned about that. So this demand from Prince Andrew amounts to the exhibition of a sense of entitlement, a lack of accountability for his behaviours, a lack of emotional empathy, arrogance, and of course the assertion of control directly with regard to his mother by demanding that he be able to appear as an admiral, and of course indirectly over the individuals by saying, look, I'm back, and now... I'm an admiral, utilising it as a way to worm his way back in to public prominence. The mail continues. Prince Andrew, who stepped back from public duties over his friendship with convicted paedophile Jeffrey Epstein 18 months ago, was made an honorary vice-admiral in the Royal Navy on his 55th birthday in 2015. He was due to be promoted to admiral on his 60th birthday last year, but offered to defer it until he cleared his name and returned to public duties. 
I suspect rather he was told, you ain't getting it, and therefore, as part of face-saving, said that he offered to defer it. Naturally, it would have not been a sensible bit of PR to promote somebody who had been hanging around with Pedo Epstein. The failure, of course, to promote him would have wounded him, and therefore he would have to assert control, and would have done so by making other demands, and, having been told that he's not going to get it, he would make it appear by saying that he was the one to offer to defer it. Again, because it comes from him, his narcissism allows him to feel that he's under control, and therefore, even though he would be denied it, he offered to defer it. So it's a little bit like situations where you've ended the relationship with the narcissist, and you've said it's over, and then you hear that the narcissist is going around telling other people that he ended the relationship. Why? Because in that instance, with that unaware narcissist, the narcissism causes that narcissist to believe that they were the ones that ended it in order to assert control. And that compartmentalization could be quite spectacular. So take, for example, you're, you are in the relationship with the narcissist and you explain, look, it's over. You make the mistake of tipping off. You ought to have just gone, but you perhaps didn't have access to my work. And therefore, you have said to the narcissist, this isn't working, it's over. This gives the narcissist, of course, an opportunity to issue a preventative hoover. And let's say you're dealing with a mealy-mouthed, walnut-balled, crybaby, middle-mid-range type B narcissist. Turns on the waterworks, please don't leave me, I can't survive without you, my world will fall apart, I can't believe you're doing this to me after everything that I've done. And this time it doesn't work and you leave. That narcissist's sense of control has been hugely threatened by your departure. You've caused massive wounding to that narcissist. Therefore, his narcissism immediately needs to cause him to assert control. He can't assert control over you. You've left, you've got on your scooter, and you've skedaddled. Now, the narcissist, driven by his unconscious narcissism, still needs to be able to assert control over you. How is that done? Well, with this middle mid range type B, he picks up the phone and he rings Mummy. And he bleats down the phone, Mum, Mum, I can't believe it. Samantha has finished with me. I can't believe that she's done this to me after everything that I've done. And turns on all of the waterworks. And then, of course, Mama says, Oh, there, there, Mummy's little soldier. Why don't you come round and I'll make you beans on toast or perhaps Alpha, Sp Alpha Betty spaghetti, your favourite. And you tell Mummy all about it. And Mummy will make sure that horrible Samantha never hurts you again. And so Mummy's support of little soldier, middle middle range type B narcissist allows him in that moment to unconsciously feel that he now has control over the now departed Samantha. The threat to his control has been extinguished. He's received some fuel which has started to heal the wound caused by Samantha's departure. The little soldier narcissist leaves his house to walk round to Mama's, for she only lives 10 minutes away. He hasn't really cut the apron strings there. And he bumps into his best mate, Joe. Hey, Joe, how are you? Hey, hello there, little soldier, says Joe. How's it hanging with Samantha? Boom. Samantha is back on the radar. The narcissist is reminded that he does not have her under control. And therefore, in that instant, his narcissism says, Samantha is on the radar, we don't have control of her, we now need to take steps to assert control over her, we can't hoover her because she's not here, and we're dealing with Joe. So, it goes to the indirect assertion of control, and causes Joe to say, causes the narcissist rather to say to Joe, oh her, well, as, as you know, she's a complete nutcase, and I've just ended the relationship with her, fuck that. Got out of dodge there. Good for you, says Joe. Bad time he kicked her to the curb. Witness, of course, that the little soldier narcissist had been crying his eyes out to Samantha when she said she was leaving, crying his eyes out to his mummy on the telephone, and then moments later is acting Charlie Big Bananas when it comes to dealing with Joe, because his narcissism, for the purpose of the facade, wouldn't allow him to dole out a pity play in those circumstances. And therefore, it compartmentalises and causes him to believe that he is the one that got rid of Samantha in order to assert control. And then, as a consequence of that, the little soldier narcissist carries on, arrives at his mother's, and turns on the waterworks again, because there's no damage to the facade by doing that, and he can utilise pity plays. 
So that is an example of the compartmentalization of that particular type of narcissist where he will go from pity plays and preventative hoover and then another pity play through an indirect assertion of control alongside a direct assertion of control, direct over the mother, indirect over the Samantha, then moving to the haughty, arrogant, oh yeah, I got rid of her. So similarly, it's likely the case that the Duke of York was told, you are not going to be made admiral, and therefore his narcissism twisted it to make it seem as though it's his idea and that he offered to defer it. The Mail article continues, Now the 61-year-old prince has sparked ructions at Buckingham Palace after he told his mother and senior officials that he wished to attend the funeral as an admiral. The widowed queen will have to make a decision in the next 24 hours. And therefore, you can see that it's made as a demand. There's no emotional empathy for the decision that his mother will have to make. No emotional empathy for anybody else in terms of thinking, not that necessarily everybody would pick up on it, but it would be reported to see that he was now an admiral. People will be asking questions of why has he got that? Why does he deserve that? And of course, it goes with his pomposity, his arrogance, his sense of entitlement. So that's a very useful little nugget with regard to another aspect of this ongoing situation revolving around the royal family of demonstrating the narcissistic dynamic. Join me in part two, where I continue to expand upon this with regard to other issues arising out of who will be wearing what at the funeral.